Welcome traders to this week's live market and trade analysis session with me, Patrick Mumley. Before we get going today, I uh, just want to jump in and uh, start off by checking in with the risk disclaimer. Most importantly for today's conversation, the views and opinions expressed by me are solely mine. They're not indicative or representative of those held by Tickmill UK or Tickmill Europe Limited. So for those of you who are here for the first time, a brief introduction to myself. Uh, after I graduated from university, I joined a city PLC consulting firm. I left with some colleagues and went on to successfully co-found and exit a consulting startup focused on C-suite executive search for technology businesses. Essentially, I had a front row seat to the dot-com bubble, witnessing people make and lose a fortune in the markets, sometimes quite literally overnight. I decided to explore my curiosity for markets. With some capital to play with and some time on my hands, I started day trading the S&P 500, or probably more appropriately at that stage, day gambling. After some early beginner's luck, I racked up some pretty solid gains. However, as is often the case, my beginner's luck went out, and as the market phase began to change, I averaged down, uh, giving back all my gains, and ultimately experiencing a significant six-figure hit to my capital. To say this was a gut-wrenching and sobering experience is an understatement. So I really had to stand back and figure out if it was feasible for me to make a living from the markets. So I decided to get serious about trading and I sought out a mentor with an excellent trading track record. Working with my mentor for a period of 18 months, it was a time during which I upped not just my technical game, in terms of researching, developing, extensively back and forward testing strategies that crucially suited my personality, all of which were underpinned by a rigorous risk management approach. But most importantly, during the period of mentorship, I significantly developed my mental game. And probably most importantly of all, I made the watershed shift from being a highly goal-orientated individual focused on financial gains to becoming purely process-orientated. So what does that actually mean? Well, it means I had to stop focusing on what I could make from the markets and start focusing solely on managing my mindset to allow me to consistently execute my trading strategy, oftentimes in the face of negative feedback from the markets in the form of losing trades. But once you become process orientated and you have a professional trading mindset, and you understand the true nature of trading being a numbers game in which you're simply playing the probabilities, you lose the emotional investment, that hellish emotional roller coaster of living and dying by the outcomes of individual trades. So I'm no longer concerned with the outcome of an individual trade or even a small string of trade. My focus on the next 100 trades because I know if I focus on excellence in execution, my edge will demonstrate itself over an extended series of outcomes. My multi-strategy approach has delivered profitable annual returns since 2008. Since 2013, I've also been managing investor capital through a managed account service, again delivering positive annual returns. I'm currently responsible for managing a multi-million dollar portfolio. Since 2010, I've mentored hundreds of private traders of all experience levels, from complete novices to former CME floor traders, in developing the technical and mental skills to reap consistent returns from the markets. In addition to my fund management and mentoring, I am a resident market expert exclusively providing market and trade analysis to technical clients. I provide an in-depth daily market outlook, breaking down fundamental and technical drivers for the day ahead. I also provide daily technical trade setup videos for about three to five markets that I'm actively tracking, I share those through the Ticknell TradingView account. I've actually posted the TradingView link in the chat there for those who want to follow along with my daily trade setup. I also run Ticknell's e-mini strategy Facebook group where I post a daily trade plan outlining my pre-market uh, trading plan for the cash trading session ahead. I give my bias for the day and specific action areas where I'm looking to engage the market. These pre-market plans have now delivered over 4,000 points of profit since we launched in April 21. Second Tickmill strategy group I run is for traders who really want to take their trading to the next level. The Tickmill Futures Telegram trading group is a real-time environment where on a daily basis I share in-depth insights, analysis and real-time trades. I also provide live commentary during the opening hour of the cash trading session in New York, where traders can essentially see in real time how I dissect the markets and identify asymmetric trading opportunities. 
These sessions act as a platform, helping traders to develop a professional, consistent approach to navigating the markets and those mental mind games that must be mastered to make it as a profitable market operator. Okay, so that gives you a flavor of where I'm coming from. Uh, just before we continue, I've actually posted the link for the Facebook group into the chat there. All you have to do is request access and you get access to my daily trading plan and, uh, and some additional uh, institutional research that I share with the group as well that uh, it's really useful to see how, uh, how the bigger players in the market are setting up and positioned. Uh, before we jump into the... Um, uh, please provide daily trade link. Um, you should be able to see that uh, in the chat now. Can you see that? There's a link for the TradingView account and for the Facebook group there. Um, so hopefully that's, uh, that's answered your question, Ka. Uh, as I say, we are going to jump into the charts now. And um, I've got a bunch of charts here that I'm actively tracking where I can see uh, setups are developing um, to, uh, to provide potential trading opportunities in the coming sessions. Uh, if you have any questions, just drop those into the chat box. Uh, you can't see the link. Can, I, can everyone else see the links that I posted in the, uh, in the chat box there uh, for the Facebook group? repost them, maybe that's what I need to do. You should be able to see the links now. Great, good stuff. Okay, so as I was saying, I'm gonna run through a bunch of uh, charts where I'm actively tracking setups. If, uh, if you have a question, just drop it into the chat box or the Q and A box and at the end of the session, I'll come back and answer any questions you have. Equally, if there's a chart you want me to take a look at, I don't cover in my deck here, um, then you can just type that instrument into the, uh, into the chat or the Q&A with the time frame you'd like me to take a look at, and I'll, uh, I'll do my best to give you a, a view on that market. So we are, as always, going to start with the S&P 500. In a pretty volatile week, as uh, the price action really driven by the, uh, the CPI release uh, on Tuesday, coming in hotter than expected, and so bringing the Fed back into, into play, really. Um, so we've got that big sell-off on Tuesday. We're now consolidating just above this internal trend line. I'm looking for any three-way corrective moves on the intraday timeframes uh, to test. 40.10 is the level I'm watching. From there, I'm looking for bearish reversal patterns to engage on the short side, looking for a breakdown to test this weekly trend line support. Now, that's going to be a key test. That's Weekly trend line now comes in at 38.40. If we hold there, then there's still the chance that we uh, trade a three-way corrective move, a bigger correction, back up into the 4,500 area. But if we fail to hold that trend line and break down, uh, then I'd be looking for a retest of the June lows back into these uh, 36.40s. Uh, and then what we'll be looking for will be any retest of that a weekly trend line from below. If we can't get back above that and it then starts to act as resistance, then the downside objective is towards the uh, 3180s, the 61.8% retracement of the post pandemic decline. And, uh, and we have an equality objective versus the swing high here at the 4360s, 3170s. So that's the target zone. And from there, I'd anticipate we we'll see at least a more meaningful corrective move, if not a tradable low. Um, so it's really going to be key to see how we play, how price action plays out at this uh, this weekly trend line. Um, at this stage, I can't. Uh, I'm not encouraged on the long side until we break out of this internal channel and take out the high volume node here, 30, uh, 4130s. So for me, at the moment, the bias is to the downside uh, as we are currently set up. Moving to the Nasdaq. Similar story, really. Um, we've got uh, what looks to me like a bear flag pattern here, and we are testing the support. So whilst the high volume node, 12,300 area, acts as resistance, I'm looking for a breakdown through the bear flag uh, to test initially the equality objective and projected a, a descending trend line support, 11,200 into these prior lows. 
And then as this trend channel resistance and the underside of the bear flag acts again as resistance on any corrected moves back into that 12,200 area, uh, we're looking for an extension to the downside to target uh, 10,400. Uh, 10,500 is the 61.8 percent retracement, similar to that uh, S&P move uh, to the downside. Is what we're looking at for the uh, for the Nasdaq there. Dow Jones using the uh, E-mini futures contract again, similar setup here on the daily time frame. Any pullbacks that now find resistance at this high volume area in the daily time frame, 31,830. We're looking for a test of this, uh, this trend line support to uh, ultimately give way and certainly think about a retest of the um, prior, the June lows, 29,600. And then as this uh, trend line acts as resistance, we have a downside objective at uh, 27,100. We're not gonna go there in a straight line, certainly, but um, it, uh, it is setting up at the moment, uh, if we take out this weekly trend line support, that we ultimately get a test down as this area. Now, again, the um, something else to, to factor uh, with these indexes is that historically um, we have uh, in down years for the S and P five hundred, uh, certainly for the S and P five hundred, and uh, and we think of that as the leading benchmark. It's it would be very unusual that we make a tradable low, at least a tradable low. Uh, before August. So what does that mean? Well, the implications of that are that, and this is going back to the 1940s. This isn't just going back over the past 10 years or 20 years. This is, uh, you know, going back to uh, over the past 70 years. And um, so the implications of that are that this June low is vulnerable. And statistically speaking, uh, it, would be, it would be an anomaly for us at least not to retest the June low, if not take it out. So just something to, to keep in mind as, uh, as we head into the remainder of September. And again, statistically, September is the weakest month uh, for equity indexes. So that's another factor that, uh, that could be weighing here on these markets. And then once we get through September, and again, just thinking uh, in terms of statistics and uh, market seasonality, we are heading into the midterm elections. Now, the midterm elections are in November, and it would not be beyond the realms of possibility that we see a downdraft into September, uh, beginning of October, and then suddenly the markets start to pick up. Obviously, uh, the incumbent party would like to uh, retain control of, of the Congress and the Senate, and to do that, one of the key uh, voting metrics for voters in the US is uh, how their 401k plans are looking. Obviously at the moment, they're not looking great as then most of them are index linked. And so, uh, like I say, it wouldn't be beyond the realms of possibility that we suddenly see an uptick heading into those midterm elections as, uh, as the incumbent party look to retain control. And, um, and one of the factors in, uh, in that will be how the, the markets are looking. So just something to keep in mind. So September, into the early October, I'm anticipating weakness, but then as we head into those midterms, it would not be surprising to see a bounce in terms of equity markets. So moving to the DAX, the DAX, um, I'm still looking for a potential rollover here uh, versus the swing high we have at 14,900 area. Uh, we have a downside of quality objective, 11,150. So any breakthrough, the prior lows, 12,360, I will certainly be looking to engage on the short side, targeting a test of that 11,150. Now you can do that in the uh, cash market, the futures market, or you can do it via options. I'm currently uh, long some puts there heading into October for that 11,150 test. Moving to the Nikkei, um, you're going to notice uh, this setup that I'm tracking in the Nikkei, uh, when we look at the ends in a bit, we have a similar scenario. Uh, so what I'm looking for in terms of the Nikkei is any pullbacks now into this ascending trend line support, 26,560. I'm looking for one more push to the upside to complete this ending diagonal <coughs> scenario, 29,615. From there, I'm watching for bearish reversal patterns, with a downside of quality objective, if that does prove to be our swing high, 29,600 area, uh, into the weekly high volume mode, and the equality objective is 23,000, 
300. Now keep that in mind when we move on to the end. So I'm just going to now start with the FX pairs and we're going to look at the dollar index first of all. I had uh, short positions running in the dollar index uh, as of last week uh, from that uh, 110 30 area and I had a couple of positions running. I got taken out obviously on the big spike up, uh, managed to lock in 200, 200 pips of, of profit there. Um, and now this, this pattern that we've got here is interesting because from a technical perspective, this big outside reversal and this consolidation pattern here in the upper end of that candle, uh, historically, I would, uh, th this is a, a strong uh, bullish setup for me. And I've been looking, so I've got a, uh, an order waiting at 109.96 to buy the dollar index. As long as we continue to hold in this upper range, if we, if today we roll over, then I'm, I'll can that order and I'll be anticipating that we are going to play a three way corrective move down into the 106.80s as, uh, as the first port of call here. But if we can get a reversal, we've got retail sales coming out uh, today. Uh, if we get a reversal and we take out that 109.97, I'm going to be engaged on the long side. And I'm going to be thinking about a move at least back in to retest these highs, 110.75, and potentially a little bit higher here. Let me just draw in what I've been looking for. <clears throat> So we'd be looking at the 127 extension of this correction, 111.55, and just above we have the 161 extension. So if we do, uh, if we do get that move up, then I'd be looking to fade any move into that 111.80 area uh, for at least another corrective move to develop. Um, if we don't get that uh, scenario, like I say, if we do roll over from, uh, from those 109.90s, then we're looking for a three-way corrective move back into that 107 area as the downside target. However, with this dollar index, as I've been talking about over the last few weeks from a weekly perspective, as long as we hold support into 105, I would still see the potential for a 114 test to the upside, which is a major, uh, the major trend channel that dollar index has been trading in. So just keep that in mind with the dollar index. Moving to the Euro, obviously, uh, retested that uh, the trend line resistance the, from the year to date uh, highs, and we held again big outside rejection. So again, similar scenario. Any breach here of 9940s uh, to me would be an opportunity on the short side. We're still looking for initially the test of this uh, 9760s, which is the yearly S3. Um, from there, we could see a correction before. Ultimately, I'm looking now at a weekly time frame for us to test into this 95 area now, which is the projected sending trend channel support on the weekly time scale. Um, but I can see the potential for a decent correction. Uh, let me just draw this, uh, reshape this for you guys actually. To update this one second. So what I'm looking at here is the potential that we hold here. We test this 96, we get a pullback, uh, back into the resistance here, the 103.50s, then that move down into the 95 trend channel support before extending it once again to the upside. So that's what I'm tracking in terms of the weekly time frame of the euro. And any move through this uh, 9940s, want to be looking on the short side for a 97.60 test as the next downside objective. Sterling. So Sterling has a couple of parts here that I'm looking at. Um, ultimately, I believe that uh, all roads really going to lead to at least a 110 test uh, in the interim, uh, firstly checking in with 112.50. So if we take out the support here at 114.70, I'm looking for a breach of the lows, takes down 112.50. We can correct from that 112.50, but like I say, um, Sterling looks pretty weak to me. Obviously, we've the unfortunate uh, loss of Queen Elizabeth, um, and uh, that's kind of distracted away from uh, the fundamental problems that the UK are facing. And I think once the uh, the funeral's out of the way and uh, the, the national mourning period comes to an end, uh, there's going to be a refocus on the problems in the UK. And I see continued weakness ahead for Sterling. Don't get me wrong, there'll be corrective periods, obviously, but those, to my mind, are selling opportunities at this stage um, with Sterling. Dollar Yen, this is one I had a, a good short running as well. Um, 
managed to sell into that 144.70 test, uh, picked up 185 pips, obviously, before it got blown out of the water, and we reversed hard on that, uh, on that CPI data. Now what I'm looking for is any push up into uh, the 145, 146 area. Once again, we've got the um, DOJ, Ministry of Finance in Japan, starting to check FX rates. So I think somewhere in this 145, 147 area, um, they may put in a tentative uh, intervention, which I think will, will drive a, correct, a more significant correction. Do I think that that's going to be the end of this run? Probably not. Um, but at least it will uh, give a, a decent corrective move to, to play for. So there's the levels I'm watching there. Uh, Ten-year yields, obviously high, highly correlated to the moves we've been seeing in the end. Potential double top here. Now, if we don't double top, what's the next level we're going to be looking at on the 10-year? Well, the next area is going to be this 127 extension, which will put us up into 3.76%. Um, again, what I'd anticipate, as long as we maintain momentum divergence, that uh, that, that move will uh, will be faded uh, initially. So we look at a move up into here, certainly then a move back to retest this double top as support. Then maybe we head to 4%, the 161 extension, um, as the next leg to the upside. And what you want to bear in mind is that if the, if the yields are doing that, then we're likely to see further strength in the yen regardless of intervention. Now, these yen crosses have some interesting setups to keep an eye on. Uh, while the euro yen holds support at 142.30s, I am looking for a test into the projected ending diagonal and the trend channel in the weekly timeframe, 147.20s, as long as we maintain momentum divergence, potential triple divergence there in the daily timeframe. I'm watching for bearish reversal patterns there to engage on the short side, looking for a move down to test um, projected ascending uh, trend channel support, 137, high volume load just below. And then again, we can make another attempt to the upside, but I'm ultimately going to be tracking weakness into this 147 area as the potential to set up a more meaningful corrective move within a much broader channel for the Euro Yen. Sterling Yen, similar situation, uh, looking for any push up into 170, let's say, 169.50s. As long as we maintain momentum divergence down here, then I'm looking to engage on the short side. Certainly, we think about a move back into the high volume mode of 161, and this ascending trend, weekly trend line support, 159.90s is, uh, is the target down there. Aussie yen, similar setup to these other ones. So we look for a push now into the 99.30s. I'll be engaging on the short side, as long as we get bearish momentum, divergence maintained down here, and we get bearish reversal patterns, then we look to engage on the short side, and we're targeting a move back into the high volume low, 9370s, and this, um, this projected sending trend line support coming in there as well, or we attempt another leg higher. CAD yen actually broke out of its, uh, its ascending trend line resistance that we were looking at last week. And again, what's important here, and this is something I stress, you know, hopefully on a weekly basis, I don't play these levels blindly. I wait for either a daily reversal or certainly a four hour or an hourly reversal before uh, looking to get in here. So we didn't get any, you know, although this was an area I was tracking, we didn't get any response from the market. So I'm waiting for the market to confirm uh, these, these setups, we didn't get that. So I'm looking now five-wave sequence to actually test up into the 112 area. And as long as, again, we maintain uh, momentum divergence here, then we are going to be looking to, or I'm going to be looking to engage on the short side. And again, thinking about a move back into the high volume mode, 105.50s is the first target on the downside. Dollar CAD, watching now for that test of the 133 level. As long as we maintain momentum divergence, we watch bearish reversal patterns, and our gauge on the short side, looking for a move down into the high volume mode there, uh, which would give us a retest of 128.70s. The Aussie, obviously inverse. I'm watching for the Aussie to test into this uh, potential ending uh, triangle pattern here, down into the 6640s. Also, that 6640s, that big equality objective on the weekly time frame. And, uh, and so what we're watching for there is bullish reversal patterns as long as we maintain momentum divergence here, engage on the long side. First target's gonna be the high volume mode up to the 69 hand. Kiwi, 
Similar scenario here, we're in this uh, projected pitchfork support tracking 5860s is level I'm watching there, just below the 78.6% retracement of the entire uh, pandemic decline. And we have 5830s as the 131 extension from our 7063 low. And so, yeah, we're watching for bullish reversal patterns there. As long as we maintain this momentum divergence, again, I'll just draw it in for you so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. So we want price to make the new low, test our support, but we don't want to see this uh, trend line broken in terms of the momentum. Bullish reversal patterns there, and we take a look back into the high volume mode at the 62 handle. That gold. I'm looking for this weekly quality objective to get tested now, 1660s. This is going to be a key test for gold here, and we're going to be looking for bullish reversal patterns. We've got some nice momentum divergence developing here on the daily time frame. So any move into this 6670, 6660, we want to see a bullish reversal patterns to engage on the long side. And then we're certainly thinking about retest of the range highs here to 1820. Uh, going to finish up today looking at Bitcoin. Bitcoin obviously reversed from the resistance area. We're looking at 22,500. For me at this stage with Bitcoin, whilst we trade below this weekly trend line resistance, 25,500, I am looking for 12,185 on the downside with Bitcoin for looking to engage on the long side. So that one is a slow burner, but continues, each pot continues to find resistance at the moment. And like I say, unless we take out this weekly trend line resistance, I'm focused on the downside, but once we get that equality test, I will be paying very close attention to the price action in Bitcoin. So those are the charts that I'm tracking uh, and the trades that I'm looking at in the coming sessions. Uh, so now if there are any questions, feel free to type them into the chat box, or if you've got a pay you'd like me to take a look at, or an instrument you'd like me to take a look at, I haven't covered, uh, equally you can do, type that in and I will give you a view if you want to give me the time frame as well. That's useful. Uh, KA, normally you trade yeah, daily reversal or a, um, or a four hour or an hourly reversal, depending upon um, the confluence that I'm looking at in terms of the setup. But more often than not, we're looking for a, a, at a minimum, really, a, a four hour reversal. And, uh, and the best trades, really, I find come from those, those daily reversals. Any other questions? And I, that's, uh, like I say, I trade a multi-million dollar portfolio, uh, KA, so uh, my risk at a, uh, on most of my positions is 0.5% per trade. But obviously, um, with my account size, that's, uh, that's a reasonable chunk of change, as you can imagine. <clears throat> Uh, again, it depends upon your, your schedule. You know, if you're, if you're trading intraday, um, there are, you know, the London Open, the New York Open are all good times. If you're trading the daily time frame, obviously you're looking at the, the daily close in New York, uh, 10, a, uh, 10 p.m. UK, British summertime. Um, but even when you get those daily signals, there is still opportunity to enter those trades uh, as London comes in in the morning, uh, seven to eight. Uh, AM UK time. If for the S&P 500, the E-mini futures, I trade the New York Open, so that's 2.30 UK time to, and I generally trade the opening hour, 2.30 to 3.30 UK time, 9.30, 10.30 Eastern Standard Time. Okay, can't see any other questions coming through, so I'm going to wrap this session, uh, if my account is 8,000. Again, it, it depends on your risk tolerance, um, Kay. I mean, I, I personally, I like, to, <laughs> I like to sleep well at night, so I keep my, my trades to, uh, like I say, 0.5% of my account. So you can get a, a calculator and work that out in terms of your, uh, if you've got eight, an $8,000 account. 1% is going to be $80 risk per trade, so $40 risk per trade. And then you adjust that lot size to your risk.
Okay, can't see any other questions coming through. I'm going to wrap this session up here. As always, traders, plan the trade, trade the plan, and most importantly, manage your risk. Until next week, thanks very much.